have your Bibles uh, this morning, open to Colossians chapter 2 this morning. Colossians chapter 2 in your Bibles. Thank you for taking time to be here at church this morning. I love uh, seeing my friends here and new friends here. And I uh, appreciate you taking time this morning to come to church. I'm excited about what God has for us this year through and in and here at First Baptist Church. My prayer is that God will grow every single person here. Now, that doesn't mean growing in the sense of eating too much food and filling out your clothes. That doesn't mean growing taller, those who are still in that stage. It doesn't mean growing better in your job, though I hope that happens. What I mean by that is I hope that this year God would help every single person that is touched by this place, this ministry, to grow spiritually. At the end of 2023, that every single person who has been any part of this church, this ministry, coming, uh, just hearing about it, that they would be closer to the Lord at the end of the year than when the year started. That we would have a stronger relationship with Jesus Christ when this year is done than when the year started. That we would have a better communication. Our prayer life would be better, would be stronger at the end of the year than when it started. That's, that's growth as a Christian. That our attitude would be more Christ-like at the end of the year than at the beginning of the year. Does anyone ever struggle with a bad attitude? Right? My hand's up. I say, oh, pastor, you have a bad attitude? Oh, sure. Slow drivers. Slow drivers. Incompetent people, they can all, man. But, but you know what? I need the power of God in my life like you need the power of God. And we ought to walk with God every single day. So we come to Colossians. Our theme for this year is being rooted in him. And that him, by the way, is Jesus Christ. All right? It's, young people, it's not about your parents. All right? They'll hope your parents walk with God. It's about Jesus Christ. Old people, it's not about your parents, your grandmother who prayed for you. It's about Jesus Christ. Not about the pastor or the staff. It's about Jesus Christ. And we all have to be and are supposed to be rooted, founded, and built up in Jesus Christ. But as we come to this passage this morning and kind of conclude our series in this passage, there's one verse that I've not spoke on yet that I want to bring to our attention today. And really, if I had to sum up the sermon, all right, and give it to you kind of in a, in a, uh, uh, in a normal earthly idea, it would be this. Make sure you consider the Flintstones. <laughs> you know, like, Pastor, you've lost your ever-loving mind. No doubt about that. Let's look at the passage and let me explain where I'm going this morning. Colossians chapter 2, beginning verse number 6. As ye have therefore received a Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding there and with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. There's a warning in this passage. This warning is that there will be concepts, there will be ideas, there will be philosophies, there will be teaching. That will not be after, the scripture says, after Christ. Or it will not line up or follow the truth of Jesus Christ. It will sound attractive. It will sound good. It will be tempting to follow. But he says, beware lest you are beguiled or spoiled or lest you are misguided by these other ideas that are after man, and they may sound good, but they're not after, they're not following, they're not, they're not in line with the truth of Jesus Christ. We must be on guard that we make sure that as we live, we follow not someone's teaching or ideas or our own ideas or our own heart, which is deceitful, the Bible says, but that we follow Jesus Christ. And he says, beware, verse number nine, for in him, that is Jesus Christ, Dwell of all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Lord, we have a few moments this morning, and I pray that your word would touch us today. Lord, I need you this morning as I speak, and we need you. We are needy people. We need your truth. Lord, I pray that your spirit would correct us and convict us in those areas that 
don't please you, don't line up with your truth, that this morning we'd follow after you in obedience. And Lord, I ask and pray that if there is someone here this morning, online or present, who doesn't know you as their Savior, who's never trusted you and tasted of what you offer and bring through faith, that today would be the day that they put their faith and trust in you. Lord, we give you the praise, we give you the honor and the glory. Lord, we ask for you to do something eternal during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Consider the Flintstones. I am not referencing a cartoon or anything else. I am referencing vitamins. Just out of curiosity, I want to know how many people take some sort of vitamins daily. Put them up there. Those who don't, I can tell already you look a little sickly already. At our house, like it or hate it, we take multivitamins. One a day. There are kids multivitamins. There are men multivitamins. There are women multivitamins. But the Flintstone gummies, they're the best. They're chewy, they're, they're delightful, and they're almost, like, they're, they're almost like gummy bears. They're almost like gummy bears. And apparently, by eating one multivitamin a day, I will be in perfect health until I die. At least that's what I read and hear. Don't you read these things? Boy, I mean, in these commercials, in, in these advertisements, if you're not taking a multivitamin, then you have one foot in the grave and the other foot on a banana peel. I mean, you are, you are toast. In fact... In fact, apparently, someone did a study on this, and 77% of the population, of the adult population in the U.S., takes vitamins. There are over 90,000 products on the market. Yeah, somebody say, whoo. You may be wondering... They said if it's beneficial to take individual multivitamins or individual vitamins versus multivitamins or both. Well, to be honest, I don't care if you take multivitamins. Because this passage is not dealing with multivitamins, it's dealing with the completeness of Jesus Christ. I've known some people who take vitamins and eat very unhealthily the rest of the time. I bet you do as well, and I would be guilty of that sometimes as well. Got my vitamin while I eat this Kogo hot dog. Well, that's not unhealthy. I mean, like, really unhealthy. Like ballpark Franks. We know that just by eating a vitamin, it would not offset lack of exercise, a poor food diet. We know that just sticking a vitamin would not solve all life's problems if I continued to still do things that were unhealthy. Yet I have discovered, I have found, that there are people in this world who view Jesus Christ like a vitamin they can take. And they think as long as I just take the vitamin, it doesn't matter what else I do, doesn't matter what else I ingest, doesn't matter how else I make decisions, as long as I have my little multivitamin of Jesus or of church, I'll be okay. And quite frankly, as spiritual people, they're not okay. Inside, they're all tore up, their minds are thousand directions here and there and, and just adding a multivitamin of Jesus Christ did not solve the problem. The decisions of their life are all over the place. You, you see this, the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You see their insides are just all tore up, their decisions and, and here the relationships, everything is all over the place. And here the scripture in Colossians is teaching us, commanding us, instructing us that there is someone that we ought to pay attention to, and his name is Jesus Christ. And not only should we walk in him after salvation, that's verse number six, and verse number seven, we are rooted and built up in him. Then we're, we're warned with his truth. But here in this verse, in verse number 10, we find out that everything we need is found in Jesus Christ. He is not just a multivitamin. He is every single thing that we need in life. Maybe you missed that. Everything that you or I need is found in Jesus Christ. There are people who are searching in this world for true love. You find love in God and Jesus Christ. They're searching for peace, and you find peace 
in Jesus Christ. They're looking for help and wisdom. You find help and wisdom in Jesus Christ. I don't need, you don't need any additives. We don't need any other self-help or reflection. All we have is Jesus and all we need is Jesus. I'm reminded of that old story about that about that, that service. It was a Wednesday night service and a pastor was taking some blessings. He was asking for blessings from the congregation and partly through the blessing time a, a frail 90-year-old man stood up and his shaking arms and, he, and his quivering voice said, Pastor, I'm thankful that all I have is Jesus. He sat back down. As the story goes, a few minutes later, a few more people were sharing, and he, this man got back up on a shaking arms. He said, Pastor, all I have is Jesus, but all I need is Jesus. My friends, this morning, I wonder, I ask, are you complete in Jesus Christ? Are you complete? Are you made whole? Are you furnished? Are you equipped in Jesus Christ? It's a song that sometimes we sing, and the song has these words, In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, what fears are stilled when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. And Christ, Christ alone. Paul challenges in this passage to be complete in Jesus Christ. I believe this morning I want to give you three, three concepts about what it looks like to be complete in Jesus Christ. When we're complete in Jesus Christ, we go to him for help. When we're complete in Jesus Christ, we, from this passage, already know that we, are began, we have begun this journey by simple faith. That's verse number six. Without faith in Jesus Christ, you cannot be complete in Jesus Christ. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are not made complete by Jesus Christ. To have faith in Jesus Christ is to have faith that he is the Son of God, that he died on the cross, that he did what he said he would do. To have faith in Jesus is to believe that he will do what he says he will do. And Jesus says that if you come to me, I will not cast you out. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved See, this journey of completeness in Jesus Christ begins with salvation. It continues in that rooting, in that foundation, at the foundation in being rooted, having those roots going strong into his word, strong into, into abiding with him. Like we looked at last week, having the structure, having him being the master architect. I want to give us three this morning, three attitudes of someone who is complete in Jesus Christ. This morning, if someone is complete in Jesus Christ, they will believe this, number one, that I don't need anything else. If you need anything else, you're not being made complete by Jesus Christ. I don't need other support. I have Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying that friends are bad. I'm thankful. I have friends in this room right here. I count you as friends. I love seeing you outside of, uh, of these walls. I love seeing you here at church, but I love seeing you outside the church, right? Running to you at, at Dollar General the other day, and I love talking to my friends here and running to you at Menards or Home Depot or, you know, or Taco Bell, heaven forbid. I'm glad for the support, but someone who is complete in Jesus Christ can say, I don't need any other support. If my friends forsake me, I still have Jesus Christ. If my family doesn't understand, I still have Jesus Christ. If my job and my peers and no one else gets it, I still have Jesus Christ. I don't need anything else. I don't need any of the support. I have Jesus. I don't need any other ideas. I have his word. I challenge us regularly here at First Baptist Church to get in and dig into the Word of God. My friends, 
I promise this book will help you. All right? And my promise is shallow compared to what God promises. He promises that his word will not return void or it will not be empty in your life. And I promise you this. I promise you this. If you read the Bible, there will be things you don't understand. I can promise you that right now. You're going to read that and say, what? But I'm saying right here, read it, and God will make it plain to you. God will help you. You'll find strength. You'll find strength when you're hurting. You'll find help when you're confused. And listen, someone who says that I'm complete in Jesus says, I don't need anything else. I don't need other support. I don't need any answers. I have my faith. I love 2 Timothy chapter 3 where it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God. Now it says man of God, but it means the child of God. It means everyone may be perfect. That word perfect means complete. Perfect. Thoroughly furnished. That means completely equipped. Men, have you ever approached a job without the right tools? Now, my wife accuses me of doing house projects as an excuse to buy more tools. Well, now you're waking up now. I don't know if it's an accurate accusation or if I'd buy the tools anyway. But I know this, in my limited experience as a do-it-yourselfer, that it makes a difference when you have the right tool. You can do a job with the wrong tool. You can hammer with your hand. You can make a stick in the wall. You'll be okay. It doesn't work as well. You can cut something. All right, with a Swiss army knife. But I tell you, a sawzall, it's a lot easier. The right tool makes the job easier. And the Bible says, all right, that the word of God makes us completely equipped, thoroughly furnished, gives us the right tools to live this life. I'm telling you, living life is not for the faint at heart. It, it's a messy world out there sometimes, is it not? There are real problems and real hurts and real struggles. There are real needs. And we know that in this auditorium right here, and we're just a small subsection, there are real things that we need God's help with. We need his tools for. Someone who finds themselves complete in Jesus Christ said, listen, I have Jesus. I don't need anything else. I read a story about a family a long time ago going on a boat across the ocean. Apparently, the story goes they were a poor family. They had saved up all their life savings to make this journey to head to, to America. On the ride over, they had not only saved up, but they brought with their extra money these little cheeses and snacks. The young boy, after a couple of days on this diet, was complaining to his father and saying, Dad, I hate these cheese sandwiches. I'm sick of them. If I don't eat anything else before America, I'm going to die. Now, no doubt in my mind, this young man was a teenager. This is how teenagers talk. If I don't have something else, I'm going to die. But before we laugh too far, just remember that in, that in the Old Testament... We had, we had a young man who sold his birthright who said, if I don't eat, I'm going to die. This is a, this is a thing that happens to me. But this the young boy on the boat was saying this, probably without much truth to it. And so the father, as a good father, gracious father, gave his son a nickel. He said, go down to the ship, to the ship galley, whatever, and buy yourself some ice cream. Apparently, as the story goes, the boy returned a long while later. His father said, where were you? And, so, and his, the son said, Dad, I ate three ice cream cones and had a steak dinner. The, the dad said, all that for a nickel? He said, no, Dad. They told me when I got there that when we bought these tickets, everything else was included. My friends, when you have Jesus Christ, everything else is included. And when you're complete in Jesus, you find out you, number one, you don't need anything else. But number two... Someone who's complete in Jesus says this, not only do I not need anything else, I don't want anything else. 
I find contentment in Jesus Christ. I find satisfaction in Jesus Christ. I have confidence in Jesus Christ. In John, book of John, Jesus speaks these words. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. When we're in Jesus Christ, we get his joy and it's an abounding, it's an abundant, it's an overflowing joy. I love Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Now listen, I like to eat. And it seems that sometimes food finds my way into these sermon illustrations because it's Sunday morning. And that's not lost on me that after Sunday morning is Sunday lunch. And many a time in this auditorium while Pastor Olette was preaching, my mind went to Sunday lunch. All right, now I find myself as a pastor here going to Sunday lunch. Now, I know what I have today I will not share because then you'll be jealous and you'll all show up in my house. So uh, we're having nothing. We are, we are not eating lunch today. I'm kidding. <laughs> we have a great lunch planned. But the Bible says that, the Bible says that once you taste of God, you will find out that he is good. He's good. He's great. You want to go back for seconds and for thirds and for fourths. He's that good of a God. In our house, we ask our kids to try different foods. Now, children, when they're young, don't naturally like foods that look strange. But because we've asked them to try different foods, we find, they find out that their, their palate, their taste buds are increased. And strangely enough, now my kids enjoy sushi. Some of you like it, some of you don't. Sushi is a very divisive food. Those who love it, love it. Those who hate it, think you're an absolute idiot. So no, there's no common ground on sushi. I only like partly sushi. No, no, no. You like raw fish or you don't. Those who don't say, you'll never get that stuff in my mouth. But throughout the years, I've had occasion to take our seniors on, on our senior trips when I was principal here. And sometimes I've had some seniors say, Pastor, they say, Pastor J.D., I'll try anything you want me to try. And I'll tell them, listen, I won't steer you wrong. Not like when I went to Cambodia to see the Ruples. When I was in Cambodia, uh, the Ruples, they were like, hey, will you try everything? I said, yes, I will. I'm there to see how you're doing. There are missionaries. They don't know there are, there are missionaries in Cambodia. And I said, I'll try anything. And they put some things in front on purpose, on purpose in front of me. Not, but I wouldn't do that to our seniors. But I tell you what, we've had some seniors who walk away finding out that there was food that they thought they didn't like, and they liked it. My friends are people who think that they won't like God. But I promise you, once you taste of him, once you interact with him, you will find out that he is good. And someone who is complete in Jesus says, I don't want anything else. It was an all-you-can-eat buffet. A high-end, all-you-can-eat buffet. On the buffet lines, there was seafood, crab, legs, lobster, succulent meats, hand-carved. The dessert table was decadent. Cheesecakes, German chocolate cakes, pies. The waiter noticed that this one lady, after he picked up her plate, went down to her purse and grabbed some goldfish crackers. He was mildly amused by that, but it's America. Do what you want to do. He was walking around, he noticed as he walked back, now he was intrigued by this situation, that every time he walked back, she kept going back in her purse for more goldfish crackers. So finally, this particular waiter could not help himself. High end of buffet, food more than you can imagine, any kind your heart would desire. And he finally went to this lady and said, ma'am, he said, I'm sorry. He said, I'm sorry we don't have go goldfish crackers here. You must really love goldfish crackers. She looked up in surprise. She said, sir, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, I really don't, but there's the only thing I can fit in my purse and bring with me. He was confused. He said, ma'am, but, but why would you want to bring him with you? He said, you can go back to the line again. And she, in embarrassment and confusion, said, I'm sorry. I thought I could only go through the line one time. 
My friends, that's what we do with Jesus Christ sometimes. You find out when you interact with Jesus Christ that what he offers is better than any high-end buffet. He offers all those things that we need and everything that we want. Satisfaction, joy, confidence. And yet I find that if we're not careful, we dip back down for confidence in something else. We try to find strength in our own ability, in our own finances. Confidence in our own ability to solve problems. And it's like we have this whole buffet of all these things that we can access because of Jesus Christ, and yet we dip down into our purse, into our bag, trying to find these little snacks. And it's like the waiter of heaven says, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but why do you keep eating goldfish crackers when you have all of this? See, the Bible says we are complete in Jesus Christ. I don't need anything else. I don't want anything else. And number three, I don't hope for anything else. In fact, when we come to chapter 3 in Colossians, you find, if ye then be risen with Christ. We understand as Christians that this is not all there is. That God has promised a future dwelling place for us. A place of perfection. A place of absolute, wonderful, amazing experience forever and ever with Jesus. That is our hope. We have hope in this life, but we have hope in the next life. I have hope in this life that God is still in charge. Every day you wake up, you can rest assured that God is still on the throne. I have no hope for anything else. Every day that you take a breath, you can know that Jesus Christ is still holding all things together. I think of Daniel in the lion's den. You can't tell me that he didn't have an ounce of fear inside of him, though he had hope. He had hope. He knew that God would either protect him or take him on to glory. That's hope. But you can't tell me there wasn't an element of fear in Daniel's mind. Boy, this may hurt a little bit. With the three Hebrew children before they're thrown in the fiery furnace, they had hope. They said, King, our God can deliver us, but if he doesn't, but if he doesn't, you can't tell me that just inside they're like, you know what, Lord, if you don't, this may hurt. There was still hope. My friends, there may be times in life that we may hurt a little bit, but we still have hope. There was a man who approached a little league baseball team. They were down 18 to 0. And he sees this young six-year-old boy smiling. He said, sorry, you're behind, son. And the boy said, that's no problem. It's only 18 to 0, and we haven't even begun to bat yet. That's hope. That's hope. And sometimes in life, it feels like it's 18 to 0, doesn't it? Oh, it does. It feels like the score is tilted the other way, that we can't get ahead. But we've not begun to batch yet. We have hope. We have hope in God, hope in Jesus Christ. Hope is an amazing thing. I read an illustration about some rats. In this illustration about hope and rats, they did an experiment with rats. They put rats, these rats, into this container of water. And in just a few minutes, the rats drowned. In this other container, right, don't look at me like that. I didn't do this, I didn't do this experiment. Somebody else did. I just read about it. <laughs> Some of you look at me like, you're terrible. I, I didn't do this in my house, all right? Clear the record. I didn't do it. But in, this other, in, this other, uh, in the other rest of the experiment, they took these rats, and they took them out every few minutes and put them back in. They found out by taking them out, the rats eventually would swim in the water for 24 hours. These rats, who hadn't been taken out at all, perished very quickly. What they realized is that these rats, for in some base element, had an element of hope. And my friends, without hope, we are most miserable. We are lost. But my friends, we have the hope of Jesus Christ. Lamentation says this, This I recall to my mind, therefore... Have I hope? There's a story about a man. He went to the classroom of 59, 59 students. 
sixth graders. This class was in, I believe it was New York City. It was not in a good area of New York City. And these kids were from low-income homes and families. The graduation, the graduation rate was awful. They brought in this man who had kind of was a self-made millionaire to, come how ins- to somehow inspire these young people in this class. He says, as I stood before these, these kids, these sixth graders, he said, I wondered how could I give them anything that would bring any kind of hope in their life. He said, I immediately scrapped my notes and spoke from my heart. I told them this. He said, I told them, stay in school. And if you do, I'll help pay the college tuition for every single one of you. What they found out, what they found out when they followed these students to college, that over 90% graduated from high school. You know what they had? Hope. So when we come to Jesus Christ, don't discount the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Don't discount the fact that, you know what? We can face another day. We can face another test. We can go through another tough situation. I I don't look forward to them and neither do you, but I do know this, that my God shall supply all my need. I know that I can have my hope in Jesus Christ, and if I'm complete in him, I don't have to find hope in a necessary analysis or hope in winning the lottery or hope that the doctor brings back this particular information. I know that I have hope no matter what happens in the God of the universe and I'm complete in him. This morning the challenge is are you just taking Jesus Christ like a Flintstone vitamin where I just kind of pop one and then go about my life? Or are you finding yourself complete in Jesus Christ? Can you truly say with Jesus Christ, I don't need anything else? With Jesus Christ, I don't want anything else. And with Jesus Christ, I don't hope for anything else but for him for work to work. And if you're not, my friend, then come back and be complete in him. Come back and put that bag back down with the goldfish. Put those other solutions aside and let him be complete in your life.